Revelation. So if you have a Bible, Revelation chapter 2, going through the letters to the seven churches that Jesus gave. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles at the back there that you can use if you want one. Or use your phone, whatever, that's fine. Let's pray. Father, we just pray now as we turn our hearts and minds to your word that you would open our hearts uh, to see what you're saying to us, Lord, to see the truth in your word and that Jesus would be revealed to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have looked at the letter to Ephesus. We're looking at seven letters that Jesus wrote that are tucked away in the first few chapters of the book of Revelation, much neglected because people don't like the book of Revelation quite often in the church, unfortunately. Ephesus, remember, was the church that was good at doctrine, but they were in danger of losing their first love, the passion they had for Jesus. We looked at Smyrna last week. That was a church that was persecuted. People were being killed. We spoke a lot about the persecuted church, and we noted that that church received no words of correction or rebuke from Jesus, just exhortations to be faithful. And now we turn to the church in Pergamum. This is, again, uh, a fascinating church. Actually, we are going to be talking a lot about false religion today. This was one of the issues in Pergamum, which will become very clear. I'll be frank with you, some of this stuff can be a little unsettling, but sometimes it's good to be unsettled and knocked out of our comfort zones a little bit. And also, the history is absolutely fascinating. I've been nerding out completely this week, so I'm hoping that I can share some of that with you this morning. So let's read the whole um, letter together. It's only a few verses, but it's actually customary when you do a public scripture reading to have a little bit of uh, uh, interaction with the audience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you all to stand, please, as we do this. I'm going to read the letter, and I will end with the exhortation saying, this is the word of the Lord, to which the congregation will respond, praise be to God. Okay, everyone got that? That's what we're going to do. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to do that again. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. Praise That's God. better. Thank you very much. You may be seated. So we are in the city of Pergamum. Just for your reference there, we started in Ephesus. We went, we did Smyrna, and all of these seven letters are just in this sort of clockwise fashion around uh, what is today Turkey. Uh, was known as Asia Minor in the times that we're looking at here. Again, Pergamon was a very prominent city, along with Ephesus, actually, but Pergamon was actually the religious centre of this part of the world. They had the first temple to uh, the Roman Emperor Augustus. If you remember, when we studied Philippians, we spoke a lot about Augustus. He was the, pretty much the first emperor, dictator-style emperor of Rome that destroyed the Roman Republic, and he took over as the, the first emperor. He is the emperor that you read about in the New Testament who ordered the census with the birth of Jesus and all that. That is Emperor Augustus. He was deified by Rome, and therefore temples were built to him Um, and the state would control his worship as a way to coerce citizens to be obedient to the the state, basically. It's very interesting. Um, But they had the privilege, Pergamum had the privilege of building the first temple uh, in 29 BC. So Ephesus, just south of them, that was the commercial centre. It was a port town. That's where a lot of shipping and business and trade went on. And in Pergamum, this was the religious centre, And thus, religion also brought quite a lot of money, travellers, pilgrims, lots of different temples. There were, it was a very, very wealthy town and very highly sought after. There was temples to many different gods there, and we talk about a lot of them. And thus, you can see, hopefully you'll see after the study, why Jesus says that this is where Satan's throne, in 
fact is, and we'll talk about that a lot. Herbergen was also a university city. It was known as the center of learning. It was famous for its library of over 200 parchment scrolls, um, second only in size to the famous library of Alexandria. If you if you've ever watch things like uh, Indiana Jones or National Treasure, always these treasure hunting movies, you'll notice that when they find the treasure, it's always the scrolls from the lost scrolls from the Library of Alexandria that are always in these sorts of movies because it's like a fascinating old concept. But it was actually Pergamum that had a, a, a rival library. And in fact, historically, it was Pergamum that headhunted the chief librarian from the Alexandrian Library and made them come over to Pergamum. And because of that, uh, the Egyptian uh, pharaoh at that time, the Egyptian king, Wanted to, get, uh, wanted to punish Pergamum for stealing their librarian, so they banned all exports of what we would call papyrus. So that's uh, the plant with early writing material. Many of our early Bible manuscripts are written on papyrus. The problem with it, it doesn't last long. It's very perishable. We don't have many of them today. However, the story goes that basically because Pergamum now no longer had parchment, they had to come up with a new way of recording writing, and they invented... Um, Parchment, sorry, not papyrus, parchment, which was a different way of preserving animal skins and writing on animal skins, which lasts much longer. And in fact, most of our very early Bible manuscripts were written on that sort of parchment. So in some ways, that whole little debacle with the two rival libraries led to the production of parchment codexes, which is why we have many of the early Bible manuscripts we have today. They were being written at that time. Bit of history for you there. Now, to actually understand this city... I'll just show you a few pictures. There's, there's fairly good archaeological remains of it. This is the Acropolis that would have been one of the market squares. You can see here uh, a very steep theatre. You wouldn't want to uh, spill your drink and fall down there, would you? Um, but that is pretty much some of what we have. There were a few more temples. We'll talk about them in a little bit. However, we're going to have to take quite a big historical diversion now to understand what Jesus is referring to in this city and also to help us understand a lot of what is going on in the world today. We need to go back to the Babylonian Empire. If you're a student of the Bible, you're probably more familiar with the Babylonian Empire. King Nebuchadnezzar um, used to a uh, very large empire, ruled the world at one point. However, we need to understand, uh, you may have heard the term mystery religions, Babylonian mystery religions. This is where many of these things started in Babylon. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar died, now you'll know Nebuchadnezzar, he's mentioned in the Bible, we have many archaeological things that talk about Nebuchadnezzar. When he died, the kingdom was taken over by his son, a man called Arwil Marduk. Marduk was the name of their chief god. In the Bible, he's, he's actually named as Evil Merodach, different way of uh, pronouncing that and saying it. It's quite common in ancient Near East. Basically, he took over. He was not a good ruler like Nebuchadnezzar. The empire gradually got weaker, and to the point that it was eventually taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire under a man called Cyrus the Great. And initially, as you may know, the Persians were quite, when they took over, they weren't like Babylon. Babylon would take over and by force they would do everything that they wanted and make everything Babylonian. The Persians usually are actually a bit more gracious and they allowed people to can keep their indigenous culture and religions. Um, you may remember it was Cyrus who allowed all the Jewish captives to return home and start rebuilding the temple, we talked about in the Bible too. However, um, at first, this is what happened. He allowed the, the Babylonians to continue with their religions. Now let's talk about these religions because we need to understand them they are still with us today, and they are quite fascinating to have a look at. These are the mystery religions of Babylon, and they will become very important as we progress through this book in Revelation, because there's quite a few chapters that deal uh, with this mystery of Babylon, so we need to understand it. Jeremiah the prophet warned uh, about one of the gods of Babylon that the children of Israel were tempted to worship. Let me read it to you. It comes from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 17 to 18. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. This is the apostasy that led Israel to be actually captured by Babylon and taken into captivity. They were worshipping this person called the queen of heaven. This is an important character in the ancient Near East. It sounds, all sounds very foreign to us, I'm aware of that. But follow with me. We're building the history and we'll bring it right up to the modern day. The Queen of Heaven was 
associated with a god called Ishtar. She was the mother goddess who was worshipped in Babylon. She was often symbolised with a lion. If you have ever heard of the Ishtar Gates, one of the most famous uh, parts of the ancient world, these blue gates, um, parts of them are in museums, I think we have some of the panels in the British Museum too, the Ishtar Gates, covered in lions. You can see close up, this is an actual, from a museum, this is one of the panels that we have. This is the Ishtar Gates of Babylon. Now, this is not just because lions are fierce and it's scary, this was because lions were a symbol of the mother goddess Ishtar, that's why they had it. And you would walk through these gates to the temple altar where Marduk, the chief god, was worshipped and where all sorts of things went on there. Ishtar was often associated with another god called Tammuz, often portrayed as her child. And she is often illustrated with a crown on her head and a child in her arms. She is referred to as the virgin, the virgin mother, the goddess of goddesses, the queen of heaven. The people would often exclaim during worship, Ishtar is great, Ishtar is my queen, my lady is exalted, my lady is queen. Now I'm sure if some of you are sensitive to religions in the world today, my lady is a very common phrase that you'll hear about a certain person in one religion. And we'll come back to that in a little moment. So this was the queen of heaven. The Minoans of that time, they had a similar mother goddess that they worshipped with a divine child often pictured in her arms. In Cyprus, they had another one. In Sumerian, they had another one. The Greeks adopted this same god. They called it Epaphrodites. So it does appear that this Sumerian Babylonian Ishtar was really the counterpart to many other gods around the ancient Near East. In Egypt, they had a god called Isis, same thing. Model of, uh, in, in Greece, it was Epaphrodite. In Roman, it was Venus. Uh, another one called Sibeli, Ashtate. All of these gods actually come. They all seem to be associated and find their roots back to the original Babylonian mother goddess. Another god that the people worshipped at this time was called Baal. Baal, you may have heard of that. Uh, Baalism included the worship of a god called Molech. Molech was a god where human sacrifices were made to. We have a lot of literature about this god and the worship of this god that took place, and you find a lot of it detailed in the Bible. It's one of the things that the Lord judged the children of Israel for as they met and mingled with these other nations. They were seduced to worship these other gods. You may remember the character Jezebel in the Bible. She was worshipping Molech, and she seduced the kings of Israel to worship Molech too. Let me read to you just from... Um, Sorry, that's not the right verse. Jeremiah 50, verse 2. It says, Declare and proclaim among the nations. Proclaim it and lift up a standard. Do not conceal it, but say, Babylon has been captured. Bel, that's another name for the god. Bel has been put to shame. Marduk has been shattered. Her images have been put to shame. Her idols shattered. So you find this stuff is very prominent in the history of the ancient Near East. Now, the Ishtar Gate in Babylon like I said, was basically what you would have to walk through to approach the temple of Marduk. Now, if you know the name, of course, the idea is this was a ziggurat, so that's a, usually almost like an Incan tower. That's probably the nearest thing we would have. And the name Babylon, of course, comes from, this was based on the original Tower of Babel. That was where the history would go back to. This is Babylonian religion, and it was very, very powerful in the ancient Near East. The Babylonian priesthood, the people who officiated all these rites, they were usually more powerful than the kings of Babylon. And this was very common in the ancient Near East. In, uh, in fact, uh, as in, if a king wanted to go to war, if a king wanted to invade another nation, they would have to get the approval of the, of the Babylonian priesthood. And this has actually carried through most ancient cultures, even up to Alexander the Great. He would have to consult the Delphi Oracle. Remember, we talked about these things. However, the high priest of the Babylonian religions was called the chief bridge builder. Uh, obviously, I've translated that, but that's roughly what it translates to. And the idea being that he was the bridge between the heavenlies and for the people. Now, if you translate chief bridge builder into Latin, obviously they weren't using Latin at this time, but later you would use Latin, it translates to the term Pontificus Maximus. That is a direct translation. Now, you may be aware there's someone on the earth today who goes by that name, Pontificus Maximus. So, where am I going with this? Just follow, stay, stay with me here. So, let's go back to the Persians. They took over from Babylon. This will all come back to Pergamum, and you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. Basically, Persia took over, 
but the Babylonian priesthood was still very powerful and they started making power plays for the throne and they were frustrating the Persians. And eventually a Persian king called Xerxes got fed up with this and he came and he completely destroyed Babylon and in the process he tore down the temples and he broke up all of their cities. Now, what happened at that moment? Was that the end of Babylon? It was not the end of Babylon. At this time, although the city was destroyed, the Babylonian priests fled Babylon and they re-established their base elsewhere. This is from uh, William Barker, a historian. He says, the defeated Chaldeans, that's Babylonians, fled to Asia Minor, which is where we're reading about these epistles, and fixed their central college at Pergamos, and took the Palladium of Babylon, the cubic stone, with them. And here, independent of state control, they carried on the rites of their religion. So all of those mystery religions that we've talked about, they came from Babylon, and now they came to Asia Minor, to Turkey, where we are here. So in Pergamum, as we've seen, you have emperor worship, um, which is basically the worship of the state. Um, It was the Roman Empire, the the Pax Romana, and all these different items that the Roman state would put on people. But they had that. And the Anchor Bible Dictionary says that about this migration of the Babylonian priesthood, it says, it is true that Marduk, the Babylonian god, suffered a degradation and defeat at the hands of the Persians. But um, though shamed, his impotence was not over. He survived and passed his legacy on through the priesthood to the Hellenistic and Roman world. And this is very important. So the Babylonian religion came over into the Greco-Roman Empire. And as you know, the Greco-Roman Empire spread across that whole area and we're still sort of recipients of much of the Greco-Roman Empire today, but they were very much in there. So in Pergamon, you had state worship, you had worship of the Roman emperors. You also had an altar to Zeus. We'll come back to that. You had a temple to Athena, a temple to Dionysus. Uh, In fact, that theatre that I showed you was actually the temple to Dionysus. The temple was at the bottom. You could hold up to 800 people safely. More, More probably they would squeeze in. The idea is that the festivals associated with Dionysus are often sexual in nature and the town would come and watch and it was like you know, that was part of the festivals that was quite common in this day and age and that was what was going on there there was a magnificent temple to Asculapius he was the pagan god uh, god of healing and his idol was the form of a serpent and there was an actual medical the university I mentioned was I say university it was slash medical school slash temple of Asculapius that was what it was and it was a sort of a mixture between the dark arts and alchemy and healing and all these different unusual things that went on there this is Asculapius with the rod of Asculapius there the form of the serpent and that is the current sign of the World Health Organization with the rod of Asculapius on their flag and you can go online, you can Google that and find that. It's all over the place. It's a common symbol because it's related to medicine. It's just in culture. It's just come from these times. The rod of Asculapius there. But let's trace the roots back. This is where this all comes from. And there was a whole temple to that there. There was also a building known as the Red Building. This was, in fact, dedicated to the Egyptian god Osiris and Horus. You may have heard about them. Uh, Again, they are the Egyptian versions that are related back to the original mother goddess of Babylon, as we saw. So this is what you had. A mixture of state worship, worshipping the government and state ideologies, mixed in within a, a plethora of different gods, generally finding their roots in Babylon and progressing across this world. The word Pergamum actually means a mixed marriage. And you have a mixture here of the state and of false religion. Two of the most dangerous things that can mix together. Two things that if you search through history, whenever the state mixes with false religion, death and bloodshed often follow. And that's still just as true today. Now, let's continue this a little bit. So, after the Persians, Alexander the Great rose to power and he conquered the known world. He he got a massive empire. Try not to go into this in too much depth. But with the flourishing of Alexander's empire, Pergamos became a a major military and political centre. Alexander, in fact, was enthralled with the Babylonian religions and he had promised to restore the city of Babylon to what it once was. However, his premature death, he got ill, if you remember, 
as he was still expanding his kingdom and he died, and his empire was then divided between his generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucid, and then that's when you had these four different empires, and the next period of history is basically these different guys fighting, trying to figure out who can get the most land under these people. One of these descendants and generals became dominant in the area of Asia Minor, and he started what's known as the Kingdom of sorry, that's the wrong one. The Kingdom of Pergamum over Turkey that we're talking about, and that reached its zenith under a man called Attalid, the Attalid Dynasty, it's called. And where I'm going with this, you'll see in a moment. King Attalus III was the final member of that dynasty. He had no children. He had no heir, and that's a problem, of course. Now, what did he do? Instead of giving it to his soldiers like um, Alexander did, he was very friendly with the up-and-coming Roman Empire at this point, and he gifted the entire kingdom of Pergamum to the Roman Empire, and it was absorbed into the Roman Empire along with all of the temples, the religions that went back to Babylon at this time, and this is the Roman Empire. So then these mystery religions, all these rites and rituals, the Queen of Heaven, they then went absorbed into this empire and they spread around the Roman Empire, which of course went to Italy and Europe and many other places like that. Now, this is how they got there. Julius Caesar, Roman Empire, everyone's heard of his name, he elected himself to be the Pontificus Maximus. Remember, that was the original name of the Babylonian high priesthood when he became emperor. So he became the supreme civil and religious ruler, the head of Rome politically and religiously. These two things were always intertwined in the ancient world. And later, jumping through history here a little bit now, the Roman Emperor Constantine. Do you remember him? When he converted to Christianity, he simply brought all of these Babylonian religions, rites and practices into what he formed as the new Roman Church. And whilst there were some benefits that came from it, Christians were no longer a hated class and they weren't persecuted so much, what did happen is you got this mixture of all of these other things that were commonplace in this empire brought in to the church at that time. And then let's trace history forward, about the 5th century, roughly. The Roman Empire was destroyed. It got weaker and weaker through their own, um, own doing, really. And eventually the emperor part of it was destroyed. So what was left? The religious part of the Roman Empire is all that remained. And that went on to become what we would call the Roman Catholic Church. And in the Roman Catholic Church, many of those rites and rituals trace back to these original Babylonian religions that came from Babylon to Pergamon to Rome, from Rome to the rest of the world. We see them. The Queen of Heaven is still very much alive in the Roman Catholic Church. We assume this was Mary, but remember this God changes its name every time it gets picked up by a new culture. Always the crowns, always the divine child, always given powers that the Mary of the Bible knows nothing of. And this is we have to understand this history. It's hard to understand and people get really offended by it, but this is ultimately what is going on here. The Catholic Church, the Pope, now took the name Pontificus Maximus. So it went from the Roman emperors to the Pope. The Roman emperors got it from the Babylonian priests. All the way back, that's where that name comes from. And this is what we have today. And this is why for many years the Catholic Church ruled a mixture again of state power and religion. The Pope at one point was more powerful than the kings. The kings of Europe had to go seek the Pope's approval before they went to war, before they did this. The Pope was one of the richest people on the world, and so was his empire. This was that mixture of state worship, basically, mixed with religion, exactly the same as what we saw in Babylon. And this is going to become very important as we progress through the book of Revelation. So that is Pergamum. That is the history of Pergamon. All of that was what we had there. So let's look at the text of the letter now. And to the angel of the church in Pergamon write, the one who has the sharp two-edged swords. Now do you remember, the image from chapter 1 of Revelation of the risen glorified Lord, it had the sword coming out of his mouth and we described that the sword was obviously a figurative sword. The word of God is referred to as the sword. The word of Jesus Christ It's picturing the sword coming against them. The sword speaks of the judgment of the word and it reminds us that these false religions will one day be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ, the one true God 
who will show them for what they are. One day, everything will be exposed, everything will be held up to the light of his word. That's why this imagery is drawn out in this letter. There shall be no excuses on the day when Jesus comes. John 12, 48, he who rejects me, this is Jesus speaking, he who rejects me and does not receive my word has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him on the last day. It's all about the word of God, as I've emphasized many times here. You have the word of men, you have the word of Satan, and you have the word of God. That is the cosmic battle of this world. We have failed uh, many times in the church and in the world to heed this warning. Quite often we quite like to achieve this comfortable mixture of a bit of the world and a bit of the church or a bit of Christianity and a bit of something else. The Lord says that's going to get you in trouble, basically. It will all be held up to the light of his word. That's what he's emphasizing here. He says, I know where you dwell where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. He knows where they dwell, where Satan's throne is. Jesus is reassuring them that he knows what they have to endure living in a city like the one we just described. He knows the temptations. He knows the lure of false religion, the sensual pleasures that are being offered to them on a daily basis. And in spite of all this, he commends them for holding fast his name. And then he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Let's talk about Satan's throne. This is absolutely fascinating. In the broad sense, it's obviously referring to the mixture that you had in Pergamon. Human government, emperors being deified and worshipped, Babylonian mystery religions, the queen of heaven, Ishtar, the serpent god. It's a good, you could see why, obviously, he describes it as Satan's throne, because you have all of these things converging on this one spot. However, there is something in this city that seems to be a, a, a focus, a localised focus for this description here. Now, just by way of aside, before we get into that, it is a good reminder to us that you know, quite often we think as false religions as just being that, someone's wrong ideas about God and someone's doing something wrong. Jesus and the Bible, they don't put it in quite so simplistic terms. They often as associate worshipping false religions or false gods as being the same as worshipping the demonic realm. Now, we don't like those words, we don't like the concept that there is spiritual realms, but of course, we actually proclaim that that is the true reality that we have and um, that's what Jesus is speaking to us about here. Now, this is why the Bible often prohibits people from going to psychics or for trying to contact the dead. This is why the children of Israel were said, you do not do any of that stuff. Not because it's false. It is false, God says, but there's also a power behind it that he does not want you being involved in. 1 Corinthians 10, 19, the Apostle Paul writes, what do I mean? That a thing sacrificed to idols is nothing or an idol is anything? No. I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. So he makes that very serious connection for them there. This is exactly what we see going on in Pergamon. Now, all of this, I believe, was localized in this concept of Satan's throne. It became a focus. The most likely candidate for this, there's a lot of scholarly uh, debate about this. This is an ancient picture of Pergamon. If you can see in the forefront, that sort of square-shaped object, that is the altar of Zeus that I mentioned earlier. And it was an altar dedicated to Zeus Soter. And the word Soter means savior. So this was a false savior. Zeus was one of the chief gods. He was a false savior. It was massive. It was 40 foot high. As you can see, it's almost like it's on the Temple Mount up there. It crowned the uh, Acropolis of the city. All around its base, it had beautiful ornate, again, we have quite a lot of this altar, it's, it's not just speculation, we, we have most of it. It is uh, carved with beautiful carvings of Olympian gods battling giants, interestingly enough. Um, many early Christian writers saw references to chapter 6 in this as the source of where Genesis chapter 6 of where these came from. If you know, you know, I'm not going to go into that now. Around the base of this you have Zeus, the chief god. You have Athena, you have Hecate, you have Dementa, you have the mother goddess Cybele, and you have Epaphrodite, the old Babylonian gods, alive and well around the altar of this throne of Zeus. So these are the links back to the old Babylonian mystery religions. Now, a lot of scholars speculate, uh, and there's a few historical writings that corroborate it, that in the middle you'd walk through up the steps 
to the center and there'd be, uh, there was an altar to Zeus there and on that altar was one of those bulls. You've probably seen this in movies. I know that this has been reproduced. A bull that is heated up, someone's put inside it and you can imagine that's, that's how it goes. Um, that was worshiping Zeus. Now, what is fascinating about this, and stay with me here again, in 1878, a German engineer excavated, the Pergamon had obviously gone to rubble at this time, the ancient city, and it was all grown up. 1878, a German engineer excavated the altar to Zeus, and he brought it to Berlin, piece by piece. And the entire altar to Zeus, most of it, some of it reconstructed, now sits in what's called the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. The whole thing, all the carvings around the side, this is in the Pergamum Museum, you can go and see it today, it's one of their, highly, one of their most sought after museums in Berlin. However, what's even more fascinating about this is when you enter the Pergamum Museum in Berlin today, you don't get taken straight to the altar of Zeus, they have also recreated the Ishtar Gates of Babylon. You see the connection between Babylon and Zeus, it's still there. This is modern day, this is 19th century. This is, you can go, literally go and visit this today. This is the Ishtar Gates of Babylon, a full-scale reproduction. And as you can just about see in that doorway there, just like the ancient Babylon of old, you have to walk through past the lines of Ishtar to get to the altar behind it. That's in Berlin today. It's crazy. Now, what's uh, <laughs> even more fascinating about this the Berlin Museum was opened officially in 1930, very shortly before a certain man came to power in Berlin. The altar caught the eye of a young man named Albert Speer. He was the man who ended up becoming Hitler's chief architect. Hitler commissioned him to build a platform for his Nuremberg rallies. If you've ever seen a video of the Nuremberg rallies on YouTube, you can still get some of them. They're kind of awe-inspiring, and I mean that in a very negative way. There's like an aura of mystery around them, and I'll explain to you why that is right now. He was the chief architect. Hitler commissioned him to design the parade grounds. One historian, Dr. Anthony Satoro, who's an expert in this area, he, re he says it like this. If you read the German written by Speer, he gives all the credit to Hitler, I think he's like a good interior decorator that hires someone and that client already has the ideas of what he wants to do and the decorator just agrees to produce it for him. So he credits him and the Hitler's architect and Hitler had obviously had discussions. I want my parade grounds to be modeled on the altar of Pergamon on Satan's throne, as Jesus would call it. Now, and that is what he came up with. He takes the exact same shape. He has the middle, all those columns. Obviously, he's made it like twice twice as large, but this is the, the structure that Anthony Speer, it's known as the Sieben Lieben Tribune, and the idea is, what he did is that Hitler had to ascend and descend these steps as the entire nation would be before him offering tribute, saluting and hailing his name. You can sense the religious overtones going on here of all of this. Now, what's also fascinating is that right in the middle of this, where there used to be an altar to Zeus, this was now replaced by the architect with Hitler's podium. And that is exactly from there, straight bang in the middle, where Hitler would stand and he would speak to his people. Hitler had wanted him to create what he called a mass experience, and Speer came up with the perfect idea for him. One of the reasons you may notice often their rallies were held at night, with fire and pitchforks. They had this, these lights that would shine up to create the massive effect of the temple. They called it the cathedral effect. This was all done at Hitler's direction. Hitler was fascinated with mystery religions, I'll remind you. The whole thing was designed to be like a religious ceremony. And it was all taking place on an altar that was built on the design of the altar of Zeus, of Satan's throne, that came from Babylon or from Pergamon all the way to Berlin in those days. Interestingly enough, it was from that podium, right where the altar used to be, that Hitler first came up with what he called his final solution. He said these words, it's kind of a verse to quote his words, but 
for historical purposes. He says, bitter complaints have come in from countless places citing the provocative behavior of Jews. This law is an attempt to find a legislative solution. If this attempt fails, it will be necessary to transfer the Jewish problem to the National Socialist Party for the final solution, which was what? An attempt to destroy the Jews. What has Satan been trying to do? We see it many times throughout the Bible. One of his chief aims has always been to destroy the Jews. And now, in the 19th or 20th century, you have a man standing in the, in the exact replica of Satan's throne proclaiming the final solution to destroy the Jews. You see, Babylon is still alive and well. Satan is defeated, but he's still trying right now. What we are studying in Revelation is the time when Jesus says, enough is enough, and it's the end of history that we're looking at. It says, uh, we read about Antipas. It says, uh, he did not deny my faith in the days of Antipas. This is back in Revelation. My witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. That was in AD 92. The word holocaust comes from the word that means a completely burnt sacrifice. It's, a, it's an old Jewish word, but they applied it to this concept. In AD 92, Antipas died as a holy burnt sacrifice. Most people assume within that bull. Centuries later now, in Nuremberg, on a redesigned Pergamon altar, with Hitler taking the place of the altar on a podium, he announced his final solution, and that ended up with the burnt sacrifice of more than six million of God's people. Now, don't tell me that these things are just a coincidence. You just cannot look at history and come to that conclusion. There is a reality to this stuff, and it's very unsettling, I understand that. And I want to challenge you now as to what the response or the solution, the answer could be. Now, you could spend a lot of time trying to track down mystery religions and Babylon and find things, fingerprints all over history. I advise very strongly you don't do that. Plus, because there's so much nonsense on the internet, I've tried to give you stuff that is archeologically and historically confirmed without really much dispute, but that is not what the book of Revelation really calls us to do. The whole point of Revelation, the whole reason it starts by giving us that impressive uh, whole chapter about the vision of the glorified and risen Jesus Christ as the one who will come back to destroy all of these things, he is the actual answer. You need to make sure that you know Jesus Christ. And then all of those other things are not actually a worry to, to you. You are his, you are owned by him. The Bible says that nothing can ever pluck you from his hands. That is the whole point of the book of Revelation. You need to know Jesus Christ. And then all these things will fall into place. Let's finish up this letter. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept a teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. Now you may remember the story being referenced here, Balaam was hired by the king of Moab to curse the children of Israel. Balak was the king of Moab. However, every time he tried, he couldn't do it. Um, the Lord didn't allow him to curse the children of Israel. So he came up with a solution. He said, what you need to do, king of Moab, to, do, to get these Israelites, is you need to seduce them. Send your Moabite women, and this is all in the context of religious festivals and the worship of other gods, send them into the children of Israel and seduce them to worship other gods and that is how you will destroy the children of Israel. Now, this is clearly a very similar issue to those people living in Pergamon who were surrounded by all these temples, all these festivals, all these religious rites, all this sensuality and sexuality going on and it was intertwined with society. So it would have meant that you didn't get to go to the hospital, the Temple of Asclepius, unless you were involved with these rites. You probably didn't get invited to the banquets. It would have been hard to work. Everything, this is how they controlled it, obviously. Everything was intertwined with these religious rites, which meant for the Christian, you had very few options at this time. And there was an element in the church that was saying, actually, do you know what? It's fine. We called these people the Nicolaitans. You just, just do that, and it doesn't really matter huge amounts. This is very similar to what happens in the church today sometimes. We still debate the, the sexual issues from the culture. We debate all these different things that come at us from the culture. Some go on one side, some go on the other. Jesus Christ says, if you're not going with his word, you will be on the wrong side because I will come with my sword in judgment. And the light of the word of God will expose all things that God has said he does not want practiced. No different, really, just different historical context. He says... Uh, therefore repent or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. This is the answer. How many times in the Bible do we see Jesus say repent? That's it. 
Repentance means stop, acknowledge what you're doing, acknowledge whether it is going against God or going for him, and if it's going against him, turn around and come back to God. That's what the Hebrew concept of the word teshuvah really meant. That is his command. He basically says, repent or else I am coming and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. If we could put this in our language, he's basically saying, deal with that element in the church or else I will. And the unspoken part is, please listen to my advice and deal with it first because if I have to come and do it, it's going to be much worse. The final verse, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give a white stone and a new name written on that stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. A hidden manna. And this is, again, of course, trying to contrast the food sacrificed to idols that all of them would have had to be either saying yes or no to in this city of Pergamon at this time. Manna, if you may remember, was reference. It's taking us right back to the wilderness years of Israel where they had just come out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness, they had no food, and God supernaturally provided for them with this manna. The hidden manna is a reference to the command that Moses was told to take some of this manna, put it in a jar, and keep it in the Ark of the Covenant, and it would travel with you as you go. That's what it's referring to. Now, prophetically, of course, there's much more to it than this, and the reference to Jesus being the same hidden manna is in the New Testament. Do you remember when he feeds the 5,000? What he's doing when he feeds the 5,000s is making an analogy back to, to God feeding the Israelites in the wilderness. And he makes that reference. John 6, 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but my Father. For the bread of God is that which comes out of heaven and gives life to the world. And then he goes on and he says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. That's his whole point there. The promise here is that if you are overcoming, if you believe in Jesus Christ, he will supernaturally sustain you. He will get you through all of these things and he will take you into his eternal kingdom. And then it says, and I will give him a white stone. There's huge amounts of speculation about this. Again, it sounds odd to us, but to the first century years, it would have been very common. White stones were used for many, many different things. Uh, in the courtrooms, they were used as tickets, as entrance fees. Um, most likely, this is um, being referred to as an object known as a tessera. That's tessera, not tesseract. Any of you Marvel fans in there? Although, actually, the word does mean space stone. There is actually a link here from, for the words, but tessera. This was a small stone or tablet used in the Romans as either a voucher or an entrance ticket. Um, quite often, uh, a name of a deity would be put onto it to represent which festival it was for. The whole point seems to be he is speaking to this church and he is saying, although you may not be able to engage and you are being denied the white stone given to you to, for some of these festivals because you're standing fast for my name, you're being pushed out of the culture basically because of your stand for Jesus Christ, he is saying don't worry about that, one day I will give you your own white stone and it will have the name that I have given you to identify and that will be your entrance into the kingdom and you will have that eternally with me. And this is just such a wonderful promise to these believers who are suffering because they are standing fast for his name and even dying for it like Antipas, his martyr there. So the question now remains for us, living in a culture where quite often the world does seem to control us. Sometimes we seem like we are very near to having the state as saviour once again. We have a mixture of various different ideologies, religions. We don't often name them with other gods now. Uh, we have a more secular mindset, but the, 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 the religious rituals are still there. The symbolism's the same. The different movements have their texts that they like to point people to. They have their things that you do and you get pushed out and things you have to do. We see it all over. This is the same spirit that we have. The only answer to this is, have you got your stone? Have you eaten of the hidden manna? In short, do you know Jesus Christ? He is the only one who will get you through it. Amen. You've been listening to Thomas Fretwell. For more resources or to support the ministry, please go to EzraFoundation.org.